there was a student who came up to Ajahn Chah once, uh, very frustrated. I think it was either Jack Cornfield or Paul Breider, and said, look, I see you talk to one student and tell them to, you know, be more strict, and then I see you talk to a different student and you say, you know, you need to loosen up. And it seems like you're teaching something different to each person. And Ajahn Chah said, look, it's a bit like I'm on the road and I see someone walking down it and they sort of are wandering off into a ditch to the right. And so I say, go left, go left. Or I see them kind of wandering off into a ditch to the left and I say, go right, go right. And it's a relevant reflection because the path and the middle path is different for each of us. And the Noble Eightfold Path is um, composed of eight factors, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And the word right in Pali is sama, which means, um, it can mean right, and it's contrasted in the suttas against the word nicha, which, which means wrong. But it also can mean harm, harmonious or harmony. And that idea of the feeling intuitively of harmony on the path and of each factor and footstep resonating with a deeper chord in us or with our life as a whole is a, an important guide because the black and white harsh metric of right and wrong don't always do justice to an experience which as we practice becomes increasingly refined and will change as we walk the path. And after a while, the metric of right and wrong no longer is as relevant a reflection as the metric and the language of the beautiful and the unbeautiful. Uh, Long Pasano said that to me, um, you know, said after a while, you know, it's not that what we're doing so often is wrong, but you do feel when it's unbeautiful. And the word harmonious, translating sama as harmonious or harmony, I think speaks to that quality of beauty and of turning our lives into a work of art, which is effectively what this whole practice is about, is carefully molding our experience and internal lives. Um, one of the practitioners here was recently telling me about a dream she had where she was being led by a manifestation of the quality, the enlightenment factor of mindfulness. And she was kind of trying to distract mindfulness because she knew mindfulness was leading her towards something she didn't want to see. And so she was kind of trying to drag mindfulness this way and that and stop. And then finally they got to a well and mindfulness just dipped their hand in the well and splashed water at her face and said, it's just water, silly. I don't quite know what that last part means, but it was a good dream, I think. And speaks to the fact that this mindfulness of the intuitive harmony of our action and beauty of that action in our lives as a whole isn't always a simple and un simple process 
free from forces trying to drag us one way or the other. Frequently, we very much want to fall into the gutter on one side or the other. And mindfulness being conceptualized as this careful guide drawing us farther along the path in spite of ourselves um, is a good image, even if I don't exactly know what the water meant. I heard a recent description of the different modes of awareness that's become prominent in modern psychology. And it begins with two modes of awareness, which most people are familiar with, of flashlight awareness or spotlight awareness and lantern awareness. And the unique distinction this time that I hadn't heard before was spotlight awareness is where you place awareness on an object like the breath or a mantra and it's object oriented. Lantern awareness is more that broad open awareness and it's temporally oriented which means it's tracking every experience through a continuous space of time. And the third sort of awareness is what they call meta-awareness, M-E-T-A, or executive awareness, and it's task-oriented. And it directs the other two modes of awareness in line with the current task and what's appropriate. So where, you know, some, the study showed that children with ADHD could have a great deal of spotlight or lantern awareness, but it might lead them to play video games for eight hours in a row. What was lacking was this quality of meta-awareness, of being able to direct the other two modes in line with the proper occasion and in the proper capacity. And that a brief practice of mindfulness every day developed this meta or executive awareness so that the other two modes were able to be directed properly and for good, better use. I think a good Buddhist analog is the concept of mindfulness and clear comprehension. Sati Sambhajanya is the Pali. And these two terms are usually paired together. Sati is the ability to place awareness on an object and also to remember and bring to mind a framework and to guide our relationship to that object of awareness. So for example, mindfulness of the body in the body, the first foundation of mindfulness would be really looking at this body just in terms of the framework, not of comparing it to someone else's body, not of thinking how you'd like your body to be, but just feeling the experience of embodiment in and of itself a very simple framework. Sampajanya is that sort of clear comprehension, the meta-awareness, has much to do with seeing the whole context, the proper mode of awareness to apply in any one moment. So maybe it is a good moment to just be aware of the body, to center, or maybe one has a hindrance coming up anger, ill will, greed, and maybe one needs to be mindful of that. Maybe one needs, which is mindfulness of feelings, or maybe one needs to be mindful of a broader scope, the conditioning, the history which brought into being these negative states. And this is really relevant for meditation because Ayananda Bodhi was reflecting to me that for her first several years, mindfulness of breathing for her was actually more a practice in mindfulness of mind. And what that means is that she couldn't keep her mind with the breath constantly. But what she learned was very relevant was more and more naming 
and coming to understand what it was that was drawing her away from the breath. So this is a really relevant reflection in that in meditation we can berate ourselves when we're unable to achieve a state of calm. But so often the great and deepest value of meditation is seeing what particular poison draws us away from that center again and again. Because odds are that if it's manifesting in that microcosm of meditation and your sit, it's also the same pattern that's dominating your actions and perception in life on a broader scale. So you notice how you are overly aggressive controlling your breath and you realize that's exactly how you're holding your loved one and trying to control them. Or you realize the harshness with which you berate yourself when you wander away from your object and suddenly realize that's exactly the same tone of voice you take towards your child. And however nice it might be to remain with the breath for five minutes straight in meditation, I think an insight into how you treat those you love is worth a good deal more. So To understand that watching how our mind gets distracted is a big part of the point. And this is a clear moment when that aspect of metta awareness, of sampajanya, of clear comprehension, is very relevant because you see when there's an appropriate shift in your framework from just trying to be aware of the breath as the breath to understanding actually what's very relevant in my experience right now is a broader awareness of the mind and of its qualities and of the hindrances and expanding and changing the framework. So it's as if you're taking that flashlight of object-oriented awareness and you figure out where you actually need to point it towards a new, new object, a new direction. The list of the hindrances is a very useful list when you're tracking this in meditation. So the hindrances are the things that draw us away from calm. And they're uh, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, which in Pali is uttacha kukucha, which is really fun to say. Wicha gicha, which is also fun to say, which means skeptical doubt. So to see which is dominating you, and just to name it, can be such a relief. And to know that that is meditation, just naming your particular neurosis is worth a great deal. And sometimes it can be easy to spot those, but the reason the Buddha planted, one of the reasons the Buddha planted dukkha, the quality of suffering or stress at the very center of his teaching is because it is consistently the most difficult thing for us to turn towards because we don't like to look at our suffering. It's why teachings that are completely oriented around transcendent states and kind of the cotton candy flavor of spirituality you encounter in so many spiritual circles is very limited because it has no teeth. It's not hard to turn towards loving kindness when it's available. What's hard is turning back around and seeing our own bruising. And that's why the Buddha plants a very clear flag in it. You can only read so many Rumi poems or Rilke poems before you have to just turn back and admit that you're in a really crappy mood because yesterday your boss was a jerk. And yet that's where the practice is. Ajahn Yaniko, the abbot of Abhayagiri, has a practice where he'll find the dirtiest place in the workshop and make it the cleanest place. And that's his his biggest practice in his entire life. And effectively, that is the Four Noble Truths at work. You see suffering, you look at it, and through that gateway, 
the third noble truth of peace opens. So yes, in meditation, knowing when to look not at what you thought your meditation object was, but rather at what's actually going on. And the hindrances are a useful list for that. But another very useful paradigm in finding that middle path with mindfulness of intuiting the harmonious route through any experience or meditation session is also bridging this divide between or finding the right balance of the enlightenment factors. Because when we talk about this quality of meta-awareness, of sati sampajanya, mindfulness and clear comprehension, so much of what it does is allow us to intuit and achieve balance in all these aspects. So that could mean switching the object of awareness to look at what's drawing you from your intended meditation object. But what it also can mean is taking careful stock of the state of the mind and figuring out from that what one needs to cultivate in that moment of meditation. So the bright qualities of the heart that the Buddha points out are called the enlightenment factors. And they begin with mindfulness. Then there's investigation of dhammas, which is sort of investigation of your experience and of the teachings, which leads to wiriya or energy, which leads to piti, P-I-T-I, which is the Pali word for rapture or refreshment, which leads to pasadi, which is a bodily tranquility, it's a settledness, which leads to samadhi, which is unification of mind, concentration, a clear lucidity, which leads to equipoise, upekka, equanimity. And in a sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses, the Buddha talks about how these seven qualities can be divided into energetic qualities and tranquilizing qualities. So the qualities of investigation of Dhamma, investigation of your experience, of rapture, and of energy are active qualities. I think the Buddha compares them to kindling a fire, where the qualities of pasadi, which is bodily tranquility, of samadhi, concentration or settledness of mind, and upekka, equanimity, are calming, tranquilizing qualities compared to cooling the mind. And mindfulness, he says, is always useful. Mindfulness is the fulcrum upon which these others seesaw back and forth. So the Buddha is very clear that you don't always activate or focus on every enlightenment factor, but you take stock of where your mind is at and decide based on that what you need to cultivate, which you need to pay attention to. And this is the equivalent of Ajahn Chah saying, go left, go left, or go right, go right, depending on which particular way we're drunkenly wobbling into. And the, it's the use of meta-awareness, of sati sampajanya, clear comprehension and mindfulness, to take stock of the context of our experience in meditation and know where to point that flashlight of awareness, what to brighten. So if one is feeling lethargic or bored or uninterested, then one wants to pay attention to the enlightenment factors that are active, like kindling a fire. 
And that can be as simple as emphasizing the inhale, like lengthening and deepening the inhale of a breath. It can be um, if one is cultivating the sound of silence, the nada sound, which is a subtle ringing or hissing right below the, uh, the auditory landscape that's always there. It takes a while to pick out, but uh, if you uh, can't find it, then plugging your ears with earplugs for a while, you should be able to pick it out. And then if you cultivate it, you can have it in mind constantly. Um, Ajahn Amaro uh, can hear it over power tools. It's there all the time. And Ajahn Sumedho reflects that the sound of silence is all that got him through the first year of board meetings when he was setting up Amravati. So that's a helpful tool. But it's also very bright and it's enlivening. It's the auditory equivalent of the perception of light and it pairs very well with the breath because the breath is calming generally. But the sound of silence is brightening. If you just stick with the sound of silence, it can be kind of maddening if that's your only object. Um, my mom says for her it changes depending on how much caffeine she's had, so keep that in mind. And these qualities of metta, the act of meditation that warms the heart, is really important too. That's an act of enlightenment factor, uh, which would be that quality of energy. So this can be as simple as if things are really dull and dry, beginning to fan that flame of inner warmth from loving kindness and finding skillful means to do that. And it can be really silly, like just thinking of squirrels or something you find especially cute. The point is to get the flame of metta going and let it warm and grow. Or imagining those you love or those you're having a hard time loving um, as a child or as an old person on their deathbed and holding their hand. And then just to recollect that every moment of awareness should be imbued to some extent with that warmth of loving kindness. And if it doesn't have that, then really consciously smiling into it. I mentioned the enlightenment factors and how mindfulness is always useful. But there's another suit to where the Buddha goes through every enlightenment factor and adds a phrase saying that this enlightenment factor of mindfulness, of investigation, of energy, etc., is exalted, immeasurable, imbued with loving kindness. So the point is that every one of those bright qualities of the mind can have the flavor of love with it and of warmth. And that's a good thing to aim for, for us kind of neurotic and self-flagellating Westerners with our wonderful burden of original sin and all that consumerist culture has bequeathed upon us. And sometimes what you need to do is also recollect your death. Because there will come decision points in your life where you're wondering and just this morning, a lot of us were uh, at the Macrina Cafe where we meet at 8 a.m. Anyone's welcome to join us. It's just a nice chance to talk. And um, a few people were talking about these decision points in their lives around how large of a leap to take, you know, when to go to the monastery, when to quit the job. And whenever someone would come to my teacher with that recollection, he would say, you know, let, let it percolate, think about it, but make it a regular practice to think about your death too. Because when you understand that you don't know how long you'll have and the preciousness of these teachings, it puts things in perspective in a very relevant way and it can bring up that energy when you need it to make that final cut or that final leap. And not that everyone needs to make that right now, but recollection of death is something the Buddha really held up, not as a morbid recollection, but because, as Ajahn Chah said, if you don't understand death, life is very confusing. Walking meditation is good for the enlightenment factors that are active. 
as are very active visualizations of the breath uh, that like say Ajahn Jeff teaches. That's an investigation of Dhamma's quality. You're investigating how the breath interacts, um, what certain perceptions do to the breath's feel. So you can imagine breathing white mist through your shoulder blades, through your kidneys, up through your tailbone, down through your head, and see how that feels. Or maybe you're restless and agitated. And that's when the tranquilizing enlightenment factors are where you want to point that flashlight of awareness. And the calming factors can really be just tracking that breath very carefully at the nose as continuously as you can, like a silk thread, or really allowing the breath just to settle into the ground. And that's a very useful grounding uh, recollection during your daily life is, um, you know, Ajahn Suchita says, when you're angry, great, power up, power up right into the ground and send your awareness down to the feet and watch how that grounds and tranquilizes so much. This is the use of becoming skilled at using the breath is that you can alter the patterns of awareness in the body upon which thoughts manifest. And you can tranquilize and alter the thoughts very effectively from the body. That applies to sexual energy too. Instead of this feeling like it needs to build and release, you can allow it to circulate and settle. And that's a useful tool to have. So we can think of this as a seesaw, balanced on mindfulness. We can think of it as a path where we're trying to maintain a steady step down the center, steering ourselves again and again towards the middle road. We can think of it as trying to maintain a measure of harmony with a deeper song. Or we can think of it as holding two things in our gaze at the same time because Buddhism and this teaching are full of strange counterintuitive truths. And it's as if one eye, you have to keep focused on one thing, even as the other eye remains focused on something very different. But somehow between those two ways of looking, one's gaze becomes full and one gains depth perception of a sort. So this can manifest in looking to both the bright and the tranquilizing enlightenment factors. But it can also manifest in terms of seeing the first and the third noble truths, where ironically, the more we're able to turn towards and carefully acknowledge our suffering as we see it, then ironically, the more our other eye is able to suddenly see a brightness that begins to glow through our life. And it's the strange and difficult thing to articulate to people that this l teaching is not a morbid or dour teaching. It is a teaching of happiness. And as Ajahn Sona says, with five years of practice, you can expect to be 50% happier. I think that's accurate. And it also manifests in terms of seeing and becoming disenchanted with our lives. But the difference between that sort of disenchantment, which so often manifests as depression, because people really do see the shallowness of the goals that society surrounds us with. The difference between that and spiritual urgency and circumspection is the quality of simultaneously becoming enchanted with this path and intuiting a way beyond that conditioned and limited reality. 
And that is the path of practice. And this is the difficult place that so many of us find ourselves in, as Ajahn Sona said, with one foot in the monastery and one foot on a banana peel, is you step into the monastery, you read a sutta, you meet people in this path who are the best you've ever met and who it feels like you've known for a long time. And in the suttas, it's interesting how whenever the Buddha gives a powerful teaching, the listener will so often say, wonderful, excellent. It's as if what had been covered has been uncovered. What had been turned upside down has been turned upright. Because each of those images have the sense of something that was there before. It's not of learning something new. It's of rediscovering something you already knew long ago. And the Dhamma, from the beginning to the end, has that quality for me. As does almost every person I met on this path. It's immediate and powerful, and it's an immediate recognition. And so with one eye, you see the limits of your life. Then you step into this brightness and you meet these people, and then you're forced to, in the words of Jack Cornfield, go back to the laundry after the ecstasy and back to the job after the meditation retreat. And it is not always fun. And yet, that back and forth is so important because you're beginning to see with greater depth and you're beginning to let go little by little of that which is not worthy of your grasp and of your gaze. But to expect that letting go which has been conditioned by lifetimes to occur without some burning is asking too much of ourselves. It's like Ajahn Chah says, 80% of the practice is knowing we should let go of something and not being able to. So to have sympathy with ourselves, trapped between, between the monastery and the banana peel, and to acknowledge that there's actually real benefit in that, and to know when you can take the leap, because that seeing of both sides of that vision, of the bright and the dark, of disenchantment and enchantment, of Plato's prisoner intuiting the cave's shadows while also beginning to see the light behind them. That's wisdom. But there comes a point where the prisoner has to turn and walk. And that's faith. And it's, yeah, Ajahn Pasno says, look, wisdom will take you to the edge, but faith is what lets you jump. And there is a place for jumping. Hold that phrase with care and some wisdom, perhaps. <laughs> um, and... That aspect of becoming enchanted and disenchanted at the same time, of the active and the passive, it's helpful to bring back once again just to the aspect of sitting, of meditation. And there's a pair of qualities called vitaka vichara in meditation, directed thought and evaluation. And in the commentaries, it's compared to the quality of ringing a bell and listening to the bell ring. And when meditation is active, you do need to ring the bell a lot. You need to drop in perceptions, apply attention and effort to the breath, bring up images of loving kindness, bring up recollections that are wholesome. But there's also a time when you need to just let the bell ring and listen. And so often we've come out of a day of just ringing the bell just repeatedly, constantly. Um, I remember an SNL skit with Will Ferrell about a cowbell. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a bit like that, I think. So we don't need more cowbell. We have enough cowbell. And I think there's really a place for putting down the cowbell and if we go into the meditation with that, 
then you know this is the problem with jumping right into metta or some technique is so often you just go right in with that same driven active mind and it's not what you need what you need is the other side of the gaze is the tranquilizing is the listening to the ring and that's when you can just step into meditation and just listen to what's going on for a while take stock and so frequently that will be the uncomfortable bruisedness of the heart it'll be the disappointment it'll be dukkha because the rest of the time in a sense we're focused on the fourth noble truth of developing the path we like to develop and build and grow but there's a reason the buddha put the first noble truth first because if we come straight to that then it's just a form of spiritual bypass and before to do we do that we have to come back and just listen to the ring and the impact of the world on us and often that's just acknowledging our own suffering and that is a an act of attention infused with loving kindness by its nature and it's also a necessary necessary precondition for any sort of active meditation i can't think of a good an snl analogy beyond the cowbell one so we'll just leave it at that <laughs> The final duality to speak to maybe is uh, we did an interview with Ajahn Sona recently on a YouTube channel and um, spoke to him about a book he's reading called The Emissary and His Master, The Master and His Emissary by uh, Gilchrist, Ian McGilchrist. And it's on the interaction between the left and right brain hemispheres. And the left brain hemisphere is linear chronological it likes to order things whereas the right hemisphere is intuitive integrative spontaneous and the idea is that when we live in modern culture we become dominated by the left hemisphere and for me this is the ringing of the bell this is the active part that likes to develop and apply attention specifically and what Ajahn Sona was saying is that what meditation really does at least he believes is reactivate and reintegrate the right hemisphere which is why as you begin to meditate you do gain more access to your creative capacities you learn to listen and the freshness of life becomes available once again and that means also that the poignancy and beauty of life become manifest I'm reminded by a of an experiment done by a journalist named Gene Weingarten where he took Joshua Bell who was a preeminent violinist in the world and he just played a concert at uh in a famous hall in New York on a you know hundred thousand dollar Stradivarius and they put him in the subway to do some busking and you can see a video of it and it looks like he's a ghost you know everyone just is walking by, by him even though the day before people had paid hundreds to see him but no one notices and then you realize in the word of the words of the article that he's not the ghost but everyone else are the ghosts because they've lost contact with any ability to really see that beauty apparent so so often for many of us that middle path towards beauty harmony and balance is actually just a stopping and looking at the violinist which is playing there for us and just this quality of coming back into balance harmony through both these direct and practical tools the buddha gave us of learning how to apply attention meditation to look at different enlightenment factors and develop them through using mindfulness to intuit 
where we need to apply our flashlight of attention, whether it is the meditation object we had established or rather just the mind itself and what's drawing us away from the meditation object whether it's on the path or our own suffering, whether it's on the active development of something or just the listening to the ring of our own experience and our own pain or our own happiness. So I wish you all the best on that path. May you not want into too, into too many ditches. Yeah. Okay, so we just keep it recording and then if people ask questions on it, it's great. So we have a few minutes for any questions people would like to bring up to discuss or talk about, either on this or other issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question for those in the live stream and elsewhere, it's going to be really hard to articulate because it's a brilliant question, but it's a hard one. It's, I quoted uh, Ajahn Sona saying that if one practices for five years, one would be 50% happier. At the same time, the path that teachers, including the Buddha, speak of to complete liberation and, and happiness of that nature seems to be to embrace or welcome suffering. And if we use this, just this word suffering or happiness, it seems like we're talking about sometimes a mundane level, but there seems to be some other sort of trajectory of the path towards something beyond that, which ironically seems to go through suffering. So what is going on in all this? Is that kind of the gist of the question. The Buddha outlines four kind of commas. There's dark comma, which is negative action leading to negative result. There's bright comma, which is positive action leading to happiness, but mundane happiness, which is an a increase in one's well-being in one's life or state of, you know, wealth situation. Then there's both dark and bright comma, which is uh, a mixture of the two, which is the quagmire most of us spend our lives wandering in. And then there's neither dark nor bright comma, which is comma directed to the end of comma. And first of all, the Buddha praises bright comma for this, you know, he says, don't underestimate merit. Merit is happiness. So there really is something to develop, developing this mundane bright comma of, you know, giving, even if it's for the, with the intention of receiving something in return, there's still real benefit in it and trying to make one's life as good as one can. And in a sense, meditation can be held that way too. If it's, you know, like you said, used to make your blood pressure a bit lower or relieve stress. Of, of a sort, you know, it can be conceptualized in this realm of acquisition and of mundane brightness. But the neither dark nor bright comma is any action imbued with right view, right effort, right mindfulness, which means it's any action imbued with the intention more or less of of attaining awakening, of moving the mind towards that. And I think a good way to think about it is like, we usually track our lives trajectory on this X, Y axis, like you were saying, you know, like where you're, you, you know, you can kind of track like, oh, the marriage is going well, that's a, you know, few points plus, the career, the raise. And there is happiness to be gained there, but you're right that something's missing. and. I think what's really relevant on the path is understanding that we're adding a Z axis, where even as 
life goes up and down on this mundane level. And, and granted, we want it to go up in general, you know, like that's not a bad thing. But as soon as we start to practice, we begin to move through a whole different dimension. And it's hard to see at first because you can't track it using ordinary means. You just start to notice that you treat people differently or react gently. M my mom, after practicing for a few years, sort of reflected that retreats didn't seem to work for her because like, they didn't seem any different than her life. But then she realized it was because her life had become like a retreat. And, and I think a lot of us have that experience where you, know, you, you don't realize how much you've changed until someone tells you after, or you suddenly realize how things have actually shifted a great deal. And that's because that, that z-axis that you begin to move through in practice, which can happen no matter what that xy trajectory is doing, is you know, developing and it's a profound change, but it's hard to see if you're not looking. And, and yeah, I think that, that sort of movement through that new axis does happen through turning towards suffering a lot. It's like whenever you're applying the Four Noble Truths on the XY axis of a mundane life, you're kind of burrowing through that third dimension in like a sort of circle of Four Noble Truths. This is a weird metaphor now, but, <laughs> but uh, something like that. I, I, that's how I conceptualize it. Be because you, you listen to a lot of the forced masters and some of them had like really hard lives, like horrible sickness, horrible war. And yet each of those sufferings was used in the service of their spiritual path and brought them to awakening. And it's why no matter what our circumstances are, if that karma is utilized for the sake of, the for of that transcendent karma, then it's all good karma in a sense, you know, then it's all part of the path. How does, does that make any sense? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, it is a shift in perspective, definitely, because if we're just focused, you know, walking along the X, Y axis in one dimension, all we see is the up and down. But as soon as we're given the perspective of the Buddha's Four Noble Truths, then, you know, our angle changes and we can actually begin to see that new axis. And you're right that we don't have the idea of immediate awakening in the Theravada. I mean, it's, you do develop the qualities of the heart little by little kind of thing. So that, that's true, I think, according to that understanding. That really good question. Um, for those who didn't hear, the last sort of comment was that in the modern era, one of our greatest sicknesses is just how much choice we have and so much information, Dhamma and otherwise, and, there's the metaphor of kind of dig one hole until you hit water and, you know, so many of us kind of dig a hole over here and a hole over here. Um, I think that's why it's useful to find kind of a core teaching that you resonate with. And within that, it's nice to kind of get a toolkit, you know. It's okay to dig a little bit here and there as long as you're kind of in the general area, I think, you know. I I've certainly found that helpful personally. But, yeah, it can be intimidating how much is there. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Is there a question from the live stream? Yeah, there's a, a long one. Um, what does Tan think about internal family systems therapy, which has the idea of there being multiple selves and to acknowledge them to resolve trauma? To me, this clashes with teachings of not-self. But, yet I can see that there does seem to be hidden selves within me that protect in suboptimal ways. So is the goal to acknowledge these with kindness, yet see them as delusions? Did people kind of hear that? Okay, so the internal family which I think Ajahn Jeff refers to as the internal committee. And he says it's not like a nice little committee, it's like the, I think he, like Chicago City Council or something. So they're kind of yelling at each other. Um, it's a good question. And how does it relate to the teaching of not self? We have a Buddhist term called Sankara, 
which means formation or program is how Ajahn Suchito translates it. And I think that's a really good translation because it, these internal manifestations are our programs in us and utilizing them to or looking at things in that way to resolve trauma I think is really helpful because so many of our current problematic behavior patterns are really old survival patterns that haven't died out and are no longer useful but that are still there but it's a lot different to look to one of those as a child in us and say, you know, welcome it in, say thank you. Thank you for protecting me, for helping me survive. Um, you know, we've, we're no longer in that situation. We've grown up, you know, please, we can take it from here. Having that compassionate view that understands your conditioning and has kindness for it is a lot different than kind of like shutting the door on each of those and just judging them because all those programs came into being for a reason. So I find that very helpful and it's also useful to, you know, look at, to see the programs, different qualities so you can kind of track them. Like you'll notice some, some kind of of those programs have a very specific tone of voice, like your mom's or someone's in your life who you really recognize. And just to get a good feel for them so you kind of can see when they're manifesting and not buy into them. Is, is, is helpful. So, yeah, I don't think they clash with the Buddhist teaching on not-self. Um, the Buddhist teaching on not-self isn't a teaching that there's nothing there. It's a not-self strategy. So it's seeing that these programs aren't worthy of identifying with because they're changing. And when you see that, then you let go. And when you let go, you come to something else. And what that is, is beyond self and not-self. And the Buddha said it's impossible to articulate, so he's not really going to try in detail. Um, but it's very useful to see the qualities of those internal family members because it lets you see them more and more as these internal characters and less as you. Um, and then you can treat them with kindness, but also not identify with them.